let's talk a little bit about the preventive medicine side of this. So before we even get into kind of the, the work that you're mainly focusing on, which is on um, taking people who are at risk for osteoporosis and maybe holding them back from that or taking people who are in osteoporosis, L let's, let's first address the question for the parents who are listening, because um, contrary to popular belief, we do not have a huge teenage audience to this podcast um, <laughs> uh, for reasons I don't understand. I, I, I just, my daughter, I my, my daughter just, she just hasn't found this podcast interesting in her little 16 year old self. Um, so what, what, what can I be doing to ensure that my seven year old, 10 year old and 16 year old are set up for the best life possible when it comes to bone health. Uh, given that I've already given them something pretty good, fortunately, knock on wood, my wife and I both have pretty high bone density, at least as measured by a DEXA scan. We could, I'd like to talk about how valid or how we could be misled by that if, if the case. So, so from a genetic standpoint, they're not set up on the back foot, but I wanna make sure that we're going above and beyond what, what, what needs to be considered for us from a nutrition perspective, from an exercise perspective, from any other lifestyle perspective to allow our kids to reach their genetic potential? Well, let's start with the low hanging fruit, which is diet. Um, I don't think anybody could argue that a balanced diet is important for everything, for every, <laughs> to be healthy, you need all the nutrients that, that we've known about for years. And the same can be said for bone. That means um, particularly, and there, there are some minutia, but uh, the most important one obviously is calcium. Uh, that the amount that you need throughout your life does vary. But by the time you're a teenager, you probably need about a thousand milligrams a day of calcium. Um, and you need the vitamin D to go with that. Otherwise you can't absorb it from your gut. So um, making sure dairy is by far the most, um, it has the, it's the most abundant source of calcium. It's most bioavailable, meaning it's most readily absorbed. Um, it's packed with calcium. You can get most of what you need um, each day from well, let's say a, a regular glass of milk. So 300 mils mm -hmm. is uh, 250 mils. That has 300 milligrams of calcium. So if you had three of those, you'd basically be getting what you needed. No, not too many people are drinking that amount of milk. Although, I suppose the number of bowls of cereal my son eats but could possibly be approaching that number. <laughs> um, so, um, but there are sources, you know, cheese and yogurt, and, and then there's the discretionary foods if you eat a lot of ice cream and cream and that sort of thing you can get it from there as well but we would say yogurt and cheese and milk are the, the best sources but that but that but but that's that's i mean 750 ml of milk or milk equivalent is is probably less than most kids are consuming yeah i, I would say so particularly as uh as they move into their teenage years and probably getting more conscious about uh, weight and are thinking that they might be drinking diet soda instead of a, a milk drink. And, and and it doesn't matter what the fat content of the milk is, I assume. Well, actually, curiously. I mean, for the vitamin D, it probably does, but does it matter for the calcium? Well, low fat milk actually does have more calcium in it just by virtue of the fact if you take the fat out, you can fit Even more, more calcium volume. In. So, okay, got yeah, it, got it. It, it, it is actually... Um, uh, and plus you can buy fortified milk. We have Physical in Australia, uh, which has more calcium in it. And I'm certain you guys fortify a lot of your foods. Uh, and I believe you do put vitamin D in your milk, I think. Um, so it's, it's nice to get, to get both, but by far the easiest way to get vitamin D is the sun yeah. and converting it in the skin. We in particular, Australia is, uh, you know, we are white people if living in a black people's country. We have a very high rate of skin cancer here. Uh, our sun is extremely strong. So we're quite scared of the sun. We cover up, we slather ourselves in sunscreen, hats, sunglasses, the whole bit. And to the extent that we've actually set ourselves up to have vitamin D deficiency, and particularly in Tasmania, very south, they, you know, th there's a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. So the 
it's important to um, figure out when is a safe time to be in the sun and ensure that you get a little bit of sun because it is by far the most efficient way to get your vitamin D. Never go even close to getting sunburn but you don't have to get sunburn. In Australia, we should be able to get our, our vitamin D requirement before 10 a.m. And, and after two, possibly a little later if you're in a really hot area. Um, in, in Hobart, in Tasmania, in the middle of winter, you would need to stand shirtless for an hour in the sun to get what you needed. So, you know, then you've got to start thinking possibly about supplementation. What what level matters, Belinda? Do you, I know in kids it's, I mean, I don't think any of my kids have, ever had a vitamin D level checked, although in an adult, we do this all the time. Um, is there a level beneath which y- you would say we've got to be supplementing you if you can't do better than this with sunlight? The problem with vitamin D is that nobody can agree. There are two schools of thought. There are two levels that have been published and people will die in a ditch over those. Um, if you've got people, smart people feeling that strongly about two different levels, it tells me that nobody really knows. What are the two levels that people are dying over? Uh, 30 is probably one of them, right? 30 seems to be one of the cutoffs. 30 is, is the, um, I believe is the deficiency cutoff 30 Mm -hmm. nanograms per milliliter and we're and 50 is considered sufficient. Mm -hmm. So in between that you would have, um, insufficiency. Okay. Um, but other people say it's 75. So I, I, and I, because this isn't really my area, I don't want to go out on a limb and say, which is which they're, they're easily searchable. Um, uh, one, there's been a lot of, uh, research done. Probably it's dropped off a little now, as we've discovered that you hyperdosing with vitamin D is not safe, uh, and increases falls, uh, the, to get somebody's vitamin D up quickly, you have to hyperdose. So people have sort of moved away from vitamin D as a strategy to prevent osteoporosis. It's really important that you try to encourage people to be sufficient. And so possibly, uh, they will need a supplement of a certain dose. That's going to depend on the person and all manner of other things. So I don't think it's necessarily help. I mean, most people are going to require a supplement to be above 50. I do. I mean, I live in Texas and our sun is a lot like yours and I'm in the sun every single day and I don't even put sunscreen on anything but my face. So my arms and legs, I'm not, you know, shirtless usually, but my arms and legs are constantly exposed. And I think if I'm not supplementing vitamin D, I'm lucky to be above 40. So I, wow. I, I do supplement with 5,000 IU daily, and that takes me to 50 to 60, um, which again, suggests I'm probably okay. Um, but, but it's not uncommon here in the U S to see people unsupplemented, um, you know, easily being in the thirties. That's, that's not on, that's not uncommon. Well, it, if, was there a reason that you started supplementing? Did you have any symptoms? Your oh, bones are fine. N- no, um, none whatsoever. I literally supplement for no apparent reason other than some loosely held belief that I'm going to be better off at 55 than 35. Um, yeah. But I don't, I don't, it's more the precautionary principle. It's more that I haven't found any compelling evidence that I'm worse off at that level. And there, there may be, you know, sort of benefits to it, but, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't feel immensely strongly about it. But again, I'm thinking about this through the lens of children where I would worry more about supplementing a kid because a, we don't, it's just too much. It's, it's harder to measure vitamin D levels in them. You don't want to go and poke them for blood all the time. I mean, like, so, so, you, and you wouldn't want to, you'd, you would just, you would hope you could get it all from milk, dairy, and sunlight, I guess would be my point. Yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. Um, you know, the other thing is too, vitamin D assays are notoriously mm. <laughs> uh, dodgy. Mm. So, you know, from one, one to the next, you may not get the same result. So I don't know. I've never had mine measured and um, 
I, I track my bones to make sure they're doing okay. And, uh, you know, that's how I choose to manage it. And, and I think, as you say, it's just going to have to be whatever your tolerance, whatever your belief is, that's, that's pretty much um, get as much education as you can and probably follow the guidelines that make the most sense to you. 